Welcome to the One Million Years of Joy podcast. I'm Dr. Andrea Benacar, your host, and my intention is to inspire you to find more joy in your life through the stories from our guests and the science on joy and purpose. Maggie, welcome. It's such an immense pleasure to have you with us today. Thank you so much for having me here. I'm, I'm really looking forward to our conversation. Maggie, you are an award-winning journalist and author focused on fascinating topics linked to the modern world realities. And you recently launched an absolutely amazing new book called Uncertain. And I absolutely love the title, by the way. And I want to start exploring with you the link between joy and uncertainty. How can individuals actively cultivate a mindset that sees uncertainty as a potential source of joy rather than a source of stress? That's a very important human question, and now more so than ever. So can you help us dive into the science uh, particularly the neuroscience and how the brain reacts to uncertainty. Yes, I think that's a great starting point. And first, I'll very briefly define uncertainty just a bit, because they're basically considered to be two main kinds. One is what we might call the uncertainty, or that's the unknown. That's, you know, what we as humans cannot know. You know, despite our probabilistic models and mathematical reasoning, etc., we can't really know if it's going to rain on Tuesday. But at the same time, very critically, there is our on our uncertainty, you know, psychological, or we might say epistemic uncertainty. And that's the human's response to the unknown. And that's really the subject of my book, because when we meet or confront anything new, unexpected, murky, ambiguous, we reach a point where we realize that we've reached the limits of our knowledge that we do not know. And when you are at that level of awareness, you are uncertain. And of course, it's really important to add that this is an unsettling feeling. You know, that's sort of the starting point. And for some people, it's unfortunately, or for many of us, it's unfortunately the end point. You know, uncertainty is unsettling. We don't like it. Therefore, we don't want to go there. And that's been kind of a both a cultural and individual assumption. And I think one of the reasons I wanted to write this book was to move past that sort of mental door that we close about uncertainty and understand what is there more to understand this innate natural uh, response to the unknown. And actually, the true story of uncertainty is far more fascinating because that unsettling feeling derives from a stress response. So naturally, we evolve to need and want answers, just like any animal or organism. And so therefore, when you do see a stranger walking down a dark alley, or you do hear about a storm coming, just as I experienced on the East Coast yesterday, um, you, you know, if you feel unsure, you feel uneasy, but at the same time, you know, your heart might beat, your cortisol might rise, you, you know, you get that stress response. But at the same time, your brain undergoes some remarkably positive changes that are newly discovered. Um, your focus broadens, your working memory is bolstered. You, in essence, are becoming more wakeful when you hit that point of uncertainty. And this is a very hot topic in neuroscience now. You know, many people are studying learning in dynamic environments and discovering that, lo and behold, there is this quote-unquote arousal, at wakefulness, I call it. They often refer to it as good stress. And so, as you can see from my description of the changes in the brain, it, the brain is setting us up to learn. So if you retreat right then and there from uncertainty, you're squandering the opportunity to learn and grow. And that I would definitively call a type of joy. So one of the first lessons I think here when we begin to unpack the true nature of uncertainty is that joy or delight can coincide with unsettling or unease even, or even stress. And so I think that's really important. I, I, you know, I know you have dealt with and unpacked and explored joy far more than I have, but personally speaking, 
I often use in talking about uncertainty words like delight or, you know, revel in or, you know, happiness. And I think that can go hand in hand with something that's a little bit uncomfortable as well, like uncertainty. What advice would you give for individuals that struggle to deal with uncertainty in their lives? Yes. And this is a really important uh, other facet of uncertainty that's get also getting a lot of scientific attention. Um, you know, we all have a a kind of a personal disposition, almost like a personality comfort zone with uncertainty. Uh, just we've all heard, you know, about whether or not we're introverted or extroverted, etc. Well, similarly, innately, we sit somewhere along a spectrum of intolerance of uncertainty or tolerance of uncertainty. And, you know, tolerance is not it really what's What's at stake here, what we're talking about is far more than the sort of plain vanilla connotation of the word tolerance. Um, if you are intolerant of uncertainty, you tend to be the person who thinks that something unexpected, like a traffic jam along the road, is unfair. You know, things that are unpredictable are unfair because life should be predictable and stable. You kind of operate on that zone. Uh, you think that uh, sometimes people sit, are angry when, you know, something is unexpected or they can't figure it out instantly. That's intolerance. It, it, it's very much uh, quite leads to uh, rigid thinking and, you know, it, it's related to people who don't like surprises. You know, we all know that kind of person. But on the other hand, you know, we can be that person very easily. When we're tired, we're more tall, intolerant of uncertainty. We don't like surprises when we're worn down or when we um, studies show that when we are ex experiencing information overload, which is just about every single day, we tend to want more certainty. That's a very that's a very interesting thing to think about, actually. On the other end of the spectrum are people who are tolerant of uncertainty. They tend to be more flexible thinkers. Uh, they tend to be more, you know, curious and they like surprises. But one of the most simple ways to understand this difference between tolerance and intolerance is that people who are tolerant or open to uncertainty see it as a challenge and others who are intolerant, who really despise uncertainty, see it as a threat. So as you can see, we're not moving away. This is not easy street. And yet at the same time, you know, there are a lot of studies that link well-being to tolerance of uncertainty. By one example, um, curious. You know, if you're a curious person, you know, we all know what that means. They're the people who ask questions and maybe they're, you know, we envision someone like a six-year-old who's full of wonder and, and child, childish delight at the world. And, and that's true. But one often forgotten or newly discovered facet of curiosity is being able to accommodate or live with, or again, delight in that tolerant, that, that good stress, that uncomfortable nature of exploring the unknown. So people who have that uh, ability, who are tolerant of uncertainty and curious, are more likely to express dissent in the workplace. Uh, you know, they're more likely to be engaged at work. And so, and that's the component of curiosity that's really highly related to, related to positive emotion and to well-being. And why is that? You know, again, you know, we're talking about something that's not easy and not all comfortable, but at the same time, it makes sense to me because if we engage with and we're curious and we are delighting in the uncertainty and the unpredictability of life, well, that means we're delighting in both the positive and also, you know, the negative. We're delighting in the all facets of life, not just in what is predictable, comfortable, safe. So we're stretching ourselves. And, and that's, that is very much where the human being thrives. That's where the child learns. Um, scientists say no surprise, no learning. So you can kind of see from the picture I'm painting how the joy of learning is very much related to the stress of uncertainty, the good stress of uncertainty and the wakefulness that it, it entails. And, and I find it so fascinating because as you were talking, I was reflecting back to times of uh, 
new beginnings, new projects uh, with my team. I, I've always had this uh, fascination with human motivation, and I discovered the, the spectrum of various needs that individuals are seeking to fulfill on mm. a regular basis. So at work, for example, someone that has a need for stability is going to resist change and not necessarily embrace new projects and, and adventures while someone that has a need for adventure. And this is my case, I have to say. So I'm one that is always asking, what can we do differently today than we did yesterday? How could we uh, reflect and think differently, step outside of our comfort zone? So this for me is exciting. It's about embracing curiosity. It's about the adventure. It's about the journey. It's not necessarily, you know, will we actually succeed? You know, yes, of course, we all have aspirations to, to have a positive outcome from these adventures or trials uh, or new projects. But I really realized that as a leader and because my personality is so focused on adventure and new, new learning, that it was actually causing so much stress for some of the, the team members that really had a very deep need for stability. Mm -hmm. And it allowed me to rethink how I approach uh, new uh, projects. And I, I realized that not everyone is on the same spectrum and uh, various life realities come into play. It has been really an eye opener for me. And I was just curious to, to know whether you had other insights from organizations or leadership practices whereby we can bring more of the behaviors that allow others to feel more joyful within uncertain times. Yes, yes. Well, um, this is all very new. And so, for instance, the study of ambivalence in the business world is something that's uh, really you know, hot and new. And there are studies that show that leaders who are actually able to be ambivalent and to embrace their ambivalence are more resourceful and inclusive. So I think one point I would say is that it doesn't have to be the case that uncertainty or this adventuresome spirit or this you know love of novelty has to be off-putting to others because very often the ambivalent leader is someone who is uh, accepting and trying to um, recruit different opinions. So being in the space of uncertainty, uncertainty, as I mentioned, is a spur to wakefulness, but it's also a space of possibility. So we're, when we're inhabiting the question, uh, we actually are able to see multiple possibilities ourselves and also be open to being open to others' multiple perspectives. And so I think that that's, you know, very much a, a, a place of positive forward movement you could call joyful. I mean, I know by the dictionary definition, uh, joy can be defined as success and again, delight. Uh, and so by having forward movement, including everyone, you can also see that as a sort of joyful process. And, you know, in my book, I studied the nature of dissent, for instance, and uncertainty's role in dissent. I've mentioned that curious people are the dissenters at work when they can tolerate uncertainty. But there's a very important role that uncertainty plays in group collaboration uh, that I think, again, has to do with aspects of well-being. So we often think that when there is disagreement, um, if we allow it to happen these days, uh, or there's dissent, um, you know, that maybe the victorious side will triumph, or the dissenter will raise an opinion and everyone will follow behind and everything will be on the same page again. But actually, the best kind of collaboration emerges from dissent and disagreement that actually spurs uncertainty in the group, that jostles people away from their comfortable assumptions. And how do we know that's the case? Because a dissenting voice or disagreeing a voice, even that's wrong, actually wrong, can actually spur better group collaboration. So in other words, it's not that the person is right who's the dissenter, it's that the entire dynamic of the group is changed. Uh, discussions intensify, in inaccuracies are surfaced, and 
what's uh, the link to joy and well-being is that that kind of group that is cultivating a mild, you know, respectful disagreement. We're not talking about the kind of, you know, polarized, nasty, hostile discussions that we see today, but, you know, truly productive, uncertainty-fueled disagreement, uh, that actually produces more energy in a group. People rank themselves as more energized, as, as, and they say that they learn more. These are actual studies in healthcare teams and other types of organizations. There's also studies from juries or climbing teams on Mount Everest that underscore the same. But it's so interesting too, and just one more tiny point is, when I was talking with neuroscientists and seeing brain imaging about and you know the, the whole new world of understanding of what the disagreeing brain looks like, the neuroscientists would point out to me that the disagreeing brain is more energetic. What, is, what do I mean by that? More regions are activated. There's more communication between different regions in the brain. The brain is really you know, wakeful and working hard in order to disagree and, and learn from one another. Uh, the agreeing brain, where everyone's kind of, once a group re reaches accord, or even two people, their brain level activity falls, they become more complacent. I call this the love seat of accord. You know, everyone sort of just wants to hang there. And so uh, if we can spur uncertainty in groups that are collaborating, uh, there are phenomenal rewards that can come up with this, including the kind of energy that, that is very truly um, related to joy and well-being. So I think that's an, an amazing an amazing uh, outcome of exploring and delighting in uncertainty again, and delighting in not knowing. Not knowing is not something to fear. It's actually our fear of uncertainty is what holds us back. It's not the uncertainty itself. You mentioned earlier that children have a lot of wonder and curiosity and we actually see it in their eyes. It, it just There's just so much excitement that is connected to uh, whatever may emerge in the coming moment, in the coming hour, and so on. I was curious if you could please share with us some of the insights between how adults versus children react to uncertain situations and what you have learned in the process. Yes, yes. I think that's a really important question. And, and one of the I guess obstacles to harnessing the power of uncertainty uh, that came up again and again, or that comes up again and again in life is the power of our know-how. It's very difficult both in creative situations and in deliberation and crises and all sorts of different circumstances to guess past what we, we already know. I mean, uh, groups that are collaborating tend to discuss what's already known among themselves and lose the hidden information that individuals hold. Uh, when we are trying to do idea generation and creativity, people get stuck on what is familiar and what is obvious. It's only creative people that can move past this and move into, of course, making new connections and, and, and becoming truly creative and inventive and original. So this is a, a true theme in the sort of annals or discussions about uncertainty. And uncertainty is a really important way for us to be at the edge of what we know. And children uh, very quickly, uh, within a few years of going to school, seem to become adult-like in that they get stuck in what they already know. And one um, really impressive example comes from a certain kind of problem, originally called the candle problem. Uh, in which people are asked to tack a candle onto the wall using, given nothing but a box of tacks and a match. And so people make a mess of this and they just cannot seem to understand how to do this. Well, the true solution comes from seeing the box as a platform for the candle. Uh, and so uh, wait, if you take seven-year-olds uh, on up through adulthood, they just see that the, you know, the tax belong inside the box and that's, they just think of it as a container. They don't really think of that as an additional tool uh, in this very, you know, 
tiny little bit of a set, you know, they have a very few number of tools to work with and they're missing one completely because of something called functional fixedness. And, and that's because they're asking themselves unconsciously, what was this made to do rather than what it, what it can do? And so, but five-year-olds, amazingly, if they're given a kind of a child-friendly type of problem, that is uh, reaching a toy bear on a shelf using a box with toys in it, et cetera, they have no trouble. In fact, they solve this problem twice as fast as seven-year-olds. And that's because, again, they just see the box, this time as a step stool, you know, a similar thing, platform, uh, as what it can do rather than what it's made to do. So they seem to be uh, able to dwell immediately in the uncertainty of the problem and not have to get past the obstacle of the knowledge that they already know. Now, part of this is just because what is expertise really related to? Well, whether it's tying our shoelaces or knowing how to get to work commuting while daydreaming all the way and hardly paying attention to the route, uh, whether it's the surgeon who kind of sails through the operation, you know, talking about their golf game. I mean, this is the sort of know-how that's called quick thinking by Daniel Kahneman. It's based on heuristics or mental models of what, how the world works that we trot out constantly and just apply to a situation. You know, you come home at night and you don't expect your driveway to be in a different place. You just, you know, you already assume, you predict, you know just what to do. And so in order to move past that, we really have to get into what we don't know, which is not an avoid, it's actually a galaxy of other possibilities. And so I think children are, in so many ways, people we should emulate uh, and look to as role models and this, in this particular regard. And I'll, I'll just also add that experts who are able to get past their know-how are called adaptive experts. In other words, they are able to be nimble in a crisis. And these types of experts actually spend more time assessing a new complex problem than even beginners. In other words, they're really willing to sit in the space of uncertainty and actually understand the options. And they are able to explore what what the uh, solution can be rather than just, you know, what their knowledge already tells them what, you know, what to do. It's really an important way to being. Sometimes we think of it as as beginner's mind, but it's a lot more than that. And it's so important to cultivate that beginner's mind throughout all our lifetime, irrespective of age, so we can live more joyfully. Yes, and also just I'd add that there are some phenomenal interventions now and programs that are exploring increasing people's tolerance of uncertainty as a way to treat depression, anxiety, worry, and even boost resilience. I mean, there are six, this is seen as a really promising tool to treat many mental challenges that are so epidemic today. And so again, we can, by practicing being at the edge of what we know, tiptoeing into the unknown, gaining uh, experience with different situations that are new and unfamiliar, we actually are practicing our tolerance from, for uncertainty and learning to live with uncertainty or harness not knowing in ways that are obviously not fearful. Uh, so this is a very, very important, uh, seen as a really, really important turning point in the treatment of, for instance, intractable anxiety. And what does that mean? Well, it's very simple. Uh, people are asked to just eat something, to try a new dish at a restaurant. And when I heard that, I thought, oh, come on, you know, I mean, that, that's really too simple. And then I began to think about how if I'm tired and it's Friday night and I want to go to the familiar bistro and I want to order the same dish I usually do, it's actually hard to live life on the edge of what you know, uh, even though I'm more like you, the adventurous and curious spirit. And so, you know, people are asked to delegate more at work because that's a form of not knowing. Or I actually practice now in the last few years, I've become an open water four season swimmer. I now live by the ocean. I swim every day, rain or shine, snow or hail, uh, all winter long. I wear a wetsuit, uh, but the ocean 
is just a beautiful ocean, literally an ocean of uncertainty. You don't know what's going to happen and the app can't tell you and even your experience can't tell you. You have to be fully alive. It's the most exhilarating thing I've ever done and it's just, I think, largely because it's a daily dose of uncertainty in a, in a way that's not overwhelming, but that it's stretching me every minute. Maggie, it's so funny that you're sharing that you're swimming every single day because my brother lives also by the, the water <laughs> in the same area where you are. Oh. And he does exactly the same thing that you just described. And he has been doing this for several years. And sometimes he's even sending me pictures where there's snow on the ground. It just snowed and he's getting ready to go into the water. And I ask him sometimes, well, are you planning to skip the swim today? And he's like, no way. This is so fun. And he's actually mentioned it, that this has helped him in the most stressful moments of his life, that it has allowed him to refocus his energy and explore possibilities. Because it's true, it's so easy to dwell into a negative mindset and look at all the horrific things that could emerge when life does not necessarily emerge, you know, as we want it to be. And it's so fascinating. I absolutely have to introduce you to him. I would love to meet him because we have a little band of merry swimmers and, and uh, we there it's become a global phenomenon. And I do wonder whether, I think actually one scientist in the UK is now studying whether tolerance of uncertainty can be a variable in one of his studies about treating depression. Uh, and I, I really think that I feel stronger, you know, both in body and mind uh, because I'm immersed in not knowing during this time. And I think that it's, of course, there are many other factors. There's the social, there's the outdoors, the, you know, fresh air and the exercise, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but I do think that it just shows that, and particularly this is important in this time because really my book argues that we should seek uncertainty in times of flux and angst and volatility, because on one hand, yes, there are rising unknowns. I mean, studies show that geopolitics and weather patterns and even work hours are becoming more precarious. That is true. But the question is, how will we respond? And so therefore, if we can respond in an adaptable, nimble, even joyful way to this volatility that we live in, then we are far, far better off. And what we need to do is to be open to uncertainty, to be skillfully uncertain and not retreat back into the certainty, the facade of certainty that, you know, humans have often sheltered in for hundreds of years, what Dewey called the quest for certainty. And I think that I'm really heartened that in medicine, doctors are being taught to admit to uncertainty, and they have told me that it actually gives them courage. Wow, uncertainty, courage? The courage of a maybe is what William, William James talks about. And, you know, there's beginning to be a little bit of talk about ambivalence as being a strength in the business world, and that was anathema previously. And now psychologists are really helping even, you know, just stressed high schoolers people with multiple sclerosis, all sorts of different populations, you know, whether or not they're diagnosed or not, you know, just people who suffer the same angst and stress that we all do, who are more open to harnessing the wonder of the world. And what a wonderful way to move forward into 2024, if we can do so with curiosity and wonder and delight rather than fear. And I, I personally, finding this out has helped me in so many different situations personally, whether I'm in the water or not. But honestly, with relationships, with, you know, anxious situations like public speaking, this has liberated me. And I'm hearing that from so many people. This, this new message, this new envisioning of uncertainty really, I think, is uh, uh, quite a game changer. Can you actually share with us one profound experience uh, that was tremendously challenging and filled with many, many uncertainties, but actually allowed you to find joy and, and grow in the process? Yes. Well, I would say uh, that probably the number one experience of my recent years has been writing this book <laughs> because uh, the, the, the research when I started writing about uncertainty, well, first of all, I was writing a different book. 
after I finished Distracted, which was all about the erosion of attention in our tech-saturated uh, world, I wanted to write a book about, you know, thinking, really, what kinds of thinking we need in the digital age. And But that, that book about thinking, uh, you know, led with a first chapter about uncertainty. And then I discovered all of this new research. It was very, very new. And all of what I discovered was so different than anything I'd ever heard about uncertainty. We usually just, again, think of, you know, mathematical models and risk assessment or just sort of embracing uncertainty, but there's no science there. And so it was the most difficult of the books I've written. It was really groping in the dark for a long time, trying to understand how to take such an amorphous concept. And I took great heart in understanding that my frustration was part of this, you know, good stress in a lot of ways, that if I was able to stay open to the question of what is the daydream and what does that do for us as people? And by the way, daydreaming is stress relieving. It's called palliative um, because you're actually asking what if questions and running scenarios in your brain. Um, so if I was, you know, stuck in the question, this understanding of uncertainty gave me a tremendous amount of patience. It didn't take away the difficulties or challenges of writing this difficult book, but at the same time, I felt as though this was part of the process, just like we can tell ourselves, the stress is part of the process. It's actually a way to the human can be on their toes and wake up to the world as difficult as that is. And, and so I really found it very, very inspiring and helpful and to understand more about how uh, humans approach uncertainty and how it's related to human thriving. And then it helped in tiny little ways. And I began to be able to, instead of when a friend or one of my daughters came to me with a difficulty or problem, instead of feeling like I wanted to push through that or offer a solution or kind of, you know, ram a silver lining down their throat, which is very, you know, outcome oriented and very efficient or everything that we prize today, I really was began to be able to, I am now much better at, although not perfect, of course, but at inhabiting the question with them. And that is truly, I think, a gift to one another. If we can be in a difficult place with one another, then we can align with them be patient with them, understand that the uncertainty can offer possibilities. And I, I think that, that that's one of the most sort of profound learning points I have gained from writing this book in terms of my own personal social relations. Can we talk a little bit about your book, Distracted, and some of the key insights from that research? Yes. Um, well, the Distracted book um, was a book that was more of a wake-up call. And, you know, I really was trying to understand, well, first of all, I'll also mention that this is, Uncertain is my third book. I first wrote a book about the changing nature of home in the digital age. Where can we find refuge when home is permeable and portable? Uh, the second was about distraction and the science of attention and now uncertainty. So I realized that unconsciously I've been writing a trilogy about facets of humanity that are right under our noses and threat woven in daily life, and, and yet so often misunderstood and actually very little understood. Uh, so the distracted book was an attempt to understand what is a, t a distraction? What does that actually mean? It usually means to be pulled away to something um, less important. And of course, it's objective what, it, what, what is important in the moment. Um, but it also in Shakespearean times meant to be fragmented and scattered. There's a line in Julius Caesar about Caesar's troops being distracted, meaning they you know, ran for the hills. Uh, so I think that it's really important to understand how we can gain a language of distraction and attention and, of course, uncertainty. And so what I did was do, as with uncertain, a kind of a walkabout, understanding uh, how our mobility and constant snacking and, and sort of move, restless movement across the earth today, the 24 seven living is actually related to distraction in what ways, or, you know, how um, our, the, our views of the internet and cyberspace as a kind of heavenly, you know, panacea for all our ills is also related to distraction. And so I, I tried to look at 
a lot of different uh, types of uh, distraction that one might not immediately. I, I tried to cast a wide net in understanding this. And I was, again, grappling with a very difficult, maybe even negative concept, but I came away with hope uh, simply because for many reasons. First of all, the conversation in and around technology has changed and become more mature and a little less binary. It's good, it's bad. And people are having those difficult negotiations with our devices, which I think are necessary. Uh, you know, we can't just accept it all or reject it all. So I think that's a, 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 f a true phase in humans' uh, relationship with technology. And I'm also, uh, as I am with uncertain, heartened by the science of uh, attention in this case, uh, the idea that we now know what attention is, whereas before it was considered this mysterious and almost a, a, a topic that couldn't be researched, just like daydreaming, just like conscious wakefulness. And many of the topics that I research are sort of used to be at the fringes of neuroscience and cognitive science and now are beginning to be, um, you know, part of the fold, uh, you know, really gain scientific attention. So I, I hope Distracted is as enjoyable a read, uh, even though, uh, like Uncertain, it also, I, I think, I hope and think makes you think about life today and gain a fresh perspective. And do you have any specific tips on how we can uh, navigate life with all these technologies in, uh, in a mindful way and um, in a positive way so our well-being is not uh, compromised, if you wish, when we often look at some of the impact of uh, being too let's just say, attached to our phone or to other activities that are related to uh, digital devices. There's many studies that sometimes indicate the negative impact that it can actually have on ourselves. Uh, any thoughts that you could share on how we can navigate the world with all this technology in a more mindful way? Yes. Yeah. No, I think, and that's a very, that's a key right there, what you were saying about mindful uh, navigation of the technology is, is really, I think, important because, um, you know, we all use technology, the internet, the devices, the smartphones, et cetera. Um, they provide tremendous amount of connectivity and information, et cetera. But at the same time, I think that it's very, very important to understand uh, you know, the boundaries that we might want to draw between other ways of living and technological connectivity. Um, it's really important to understand, you know, how much is too much, even if it's just for you personally or for your child. And it's really under important to understand the latest research, you know, just a brief searching online, a brief Google time Googling actually makes people come away thinking that they know more than they do. So they lose that, you know, recognition of the limits of their knowledge. And, and this type of research is really important, um, I think, you know, for us all to keep tabs on. Um, and so, but I would say that drawing boundaries is one of the most important ways we can um, kind of corral a, a technology into our lives in manageable ways. Um, you know, uh, putting this, this, the smartphone off your desk when you're trying to focus. Not, not all work demands deeper focus, but when you need to focus deeply and get to the root of a problem, that's when you need to have the skill. And we can't have the skill uh, if we don't practice the skill because the brain is mutable and plastic. So it's really important to set aside that phone during the day or all day Sunday or when you're playing cards with your kid or you know, when you're at the dinner table, things like that. Give yourself time you know, away from the phone. It's, a, it's very, very important um, because it's such a, a powerful, even subconscious influence on our lives. Parents who are at museums, studies show who uh, use their phones quite a bit, come away from the museum experience feeling like it wasn't as enjoyable as those who actually try to put it away. Of course, they still need the phone in the museum, but you know, we're not talking again about leaving it in the car. You need that tool. But at the same time, life becomes less enjoyable. And it makes sense when we're fragmented and distracted and not really there. It's just a very frustrating experience for people. So I'd say until technology and the internet can aesthetically 
and strategically, practically look and feel different until it's less narrowly based on instant answers, you know, uh, templates, bullet points, uh, a certain type of knowledge, then we need to step away from that very, very narrow vessel and influence on our lives and gain other types of ex human experience. You know, everything from daydreaming to have a having a difficult conversation that moves a friendship forward. These are really important other ways of being that we shouldn't lose as humans. And unfortunately, for the moment, technology is designed in very, very, very narrow ways. Uh, so as good as it is, we need to broaden our human experience. Uh, and that's, I think, you know, from class, the time of the classical philosophers on down to, um, you know, Buddhist thinkers or, you know, all the great religions will say that uh, that kind of uh, varied human experience is really important for, again, thriving as a person. As we're looking at technology and now with the uh, exponential growth uh, around AI, I was curious to get your views on how this can impact our world or even the world of journalism itself. Well, it's a really, I, I, I guess the answer would be, I don't know, <laughs> but I would say that we also need to steer clear of binary thinking, which does creep into discussions around AI. It's either going to be great or, you know, I could, I see that, I see that type of reporting in the media or but even uh, on the part of inventors or the part of practitioners in medicine, uh, you know, this will, you know, da, 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 fill in the blank, answer all our prayers, et cetera, et cetera. So I think that we need to steer really clear of saying, oh, the sky is falling, AI will kill us all, or it's going to solve all our problems and, and gain more nuance. And, and one of the ways we can gain more nuance is to be unsure. Being unsure means being more thoroughly deliberative. Um, and one of the most interesting findings that I came to learn in writing this book was how important uncertainty is becoming for AI. And just to briefly explain, uh, AI has been grounded in uh, a certain type of very narrow rationalist classical view of intelligence that means a, a system or a person attains their goals. That's it. So therefore, the AI, uh, the robot or model or whatever, um, you know, you give it a goal, like stack a package in the Amazon warehouse, and it can do it without human oversight. So that's risky, but it's also wondrous. Well, now there's a movement among some of AI's top leaders to actually make AI more unsure in its aims. And that means to be a little bit more teachable, influenceable, honest, transparent in the process, not just to be outcome oriented. It stacks the package, but maybe it'll run down the worker. Uh, it stacks the package, but maybe it will um, you know, do so in a way that damages the goods and you actually uh, currently AI can't be trained on the fly. So I think this is a really heartening new, I met one of the world's first what I call the I don't know robots, and to make AI honest, transparent, teachable, etc., is a way down the road, if this uh, becomes a dominant form of technology, to actually hold up a mirror to our better selves, because we are so influenced by technology that uh, the AI that can be uncertain might actually make us value uncertainty more. And that's, that's actually really hopeful. Um, you know, technologists who are creating uh, human compatible or unsure AI told me that, you know, building the humble robot is actually teaching them a little bit about how to be more humble and honest, et cetera, and accrue these values in their lives. And so there's a, a new vision of a relationship with technology uh, that could also add to, you know, our well-being, which is really exciting. Exciting indeed. So talking about the future, and now that you have uh, written these three amazing books, uh, any ideas or inspirations that you think you will be pursuing in the near future with your writings? Well, I think there's still a lot more to be written about uncertainty. I have new articles coming down the road uh, that will 
unpack a little bit more of the latest science on resilience and uncertainty, tolerance of uncertainty and resilience. Um, I'm, you know, interested in spreading the word about this book. And then I do find that when I finish a book, not only is my attention fully devoted to bringing the book out into the world and speaking about it, but also I'm, I like to let ideas percolate. Uh, because I don't write books very quickly, I spend years with a certain topic. It has to be the right topic. And so it's not something I can kind of dash into. I have, I have various ideas, but none of them are ready for, um, you know, prime time, as we might say. <laughs> This book has given me a lot to think about uh, in terms of the way our society functions, how I personally might, you know, have always come to think stability and predictability is something to achieve as adventuresome as I am. So it's really jostled some of my value systems and I'm kind of trying to understand how how that works in my own daily life. So it's interesting. Maggie, do you have any final thoughts uh, or words of inspiration for our listeners? Well, I would say that much of what I've talked about, uh, you know, is about understanding uncertainty as an approach to life, not just a cognitive state. And again, if we can be more practiced in and experienced with and less fearful of not knowing, uh, then we can become more open to all of life. Uh, because basically, you know, life will always be uh, unpredictable and mutable and dynamic. So I see uncertainty as a kind of honesty. It allows us to open up our eyes and to admit to the, uh, imperfection, if you will, or at least we can say the mutability, dynamism of life that allows us to crawl out from under kind of the, the cave of our uh, hopes that life will be otherwise. Uh, and I, I think that, you know, I, I, I find it very, very inspiring to um, think about uncertainty in this new way. Very inspiring indeed. Maggie, it's been such an immense pleasure. Thank you for your time. And, uh, I wish you continued success moving forward and look forward to reading your upcoming books. Thank you so much. Yes, yes. I hope you enjoy it. And, um, you know, people can find more of my articles, uh, other podcasts, etc., on my website, maggie-jackson.com. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Thank you.